Tuesday State. I'd like to add my personal thanks to the, the committee for inviting me here, without which I would not be able to attend. Uh, yes, I work for NASA, but not today. Uh, I am not representing NASA because to represent NASA would be to work for NASA today, and that is, of course, against the law. So if there's any Inspector General people in the back of the audience, uh, I'm not working for NASA today. Thank you. Um, let me ask the answer right off the question that I've been asked probably 20 times since I got here. What is NASA's interest in biochar? And the answer is really not much. Um, NASA is a landowner. We have uh, many different uh, campuses. Uh, my campus in Southeast Virginia is uh, probably 300 acres. And uh, in terms of uh, being a good steward, there's a, a, a something to be said about using biochar. So that's the wedge that I've been using to do biochar community outreach and things on the, on the Space Center campus. Uh, and really that's all there is. My boss lets me use a very small amount of my time and a very small amount of uh, leftover money to do these things. But NASA really has no particular interest in biochar. Now for those of you who compulsively read the program, you may see that uh, in the uh, description of this talk, it says that I'm going to talk about a project that we have on the campus, on the, the NASA campus. I actually didn't come prepared to do that. That kind of surprised me um, when I saw that. Uh, I'm happy to do it uh, off the cuff at the end if we have the time and you have the interest. It's not a big, big deal, but you know, I'll talk about it if, if we do that. In any event, uh, what I'm here to talk about is the biochar education package that I put together with help from some people in the room a couple of years ago. I have to say that as a scientist, nothing, nothing makes me quite as irate as people who treat science as another flavor of religion with doctrines and creeds that can be accepted or rejected on the basis of belief. It's okay to believe that the sun revolve, that the earth revolves around the sun, but it's not okay to believe that the earth, the, the universe is 13 and a half billion years old. It's okay to believe that germs cause disease, but it's not okay to believe in the evolutionary processes that created germs and disease and that whole relationship. Now, to some extent, uh, some ignorance is excusable, but not as much of an ignorance as there is around. Let me give you an anecdote. My husband works for the FAA in the office that is trying to uh, establish regulations for commercial space. And uh, he, uh, in the recent past, locked horns with a lawyer in his office who was wagging his finger in his face, telling him all about, you know, the law is the law and you got to obey the law. And my husband was trying to make a point about how infeasible that was in this cir circumstance, said, um, yeah, but what if the laws of physics are in conflict with the laws of man? And he expected that to be a rhetorical question, but the lawyer jumped right up and said without skipping a beat, then the laws of man win. <laughs> okay, so here we have an educated, presumably intelligent person who is missing something central in his understanding of, of the whole business of science. Now, once a person is invested in ignorance or error, there's probably no hope for them. But the children, the children, maybe we can nip this in the bud. Maybe we can provide the children with an, uh, a better understanding of science that allows them to understand that science is not a religion that you can't pick one piece and not another. And as I was working in the biochar area, I had this opportunity to, uh, to see biochar first as a very holistic integrating discipline that integrates everything from combustion science to soil science, earth science, climate science, and so forth. Uh, so it's, it struck me, and, and the way we structured this education package was to take a very pan-scientific view of, uh, of biochar uh, and hopefully uh, to get the children to see the bigger picture of science in the context of biochar. Now, uh, everyone knows that, that NASA has a mission in space, and everyone who is prepared to decode NASA's acronym knows we have an aeronautics mission, too, as NASA Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, and I think everyone knows we have a science mission, cosmology, astronomy, uh, space telescopes, and a mission to in atmospheric and earth science in as much as you can see them from space or overhead. 
But I bet you, you didn't know that NASA also has a mission in education, a mission that it takes very seriously. Uh, NASA uh, devotes about 1% of its uh, $16 billion annual budget for that. That's a lot of bananas. And NASA has gotten some very good um, uh, uh, reviews on its educational products. Now, I frankly admit I didn't know NASA had this fourth educational mission. And when I found out about it, uh, I found out about this particular program where NASA goes out and a invites amateurs, uh, non-NASA people, to submit a package that would then uh, be distributed by NASA to schools throughout the country. They ask for uh, ideas in earth and space sciences, and, the, uh, and they will uh, then uh, every quarter they go out and, and ask for these, uh, solicit these opportunities. They distribute it to 20,000 schools across the country. Uh, and uh, they re rigorously review these uh, packages for academic uh, relevance and, and standards. And I was uh, relatively new in the biochar area working on outreach uh, in the local community and I thought, wow, 20,000 schools. That would be a great way to get biochar on a lot of horizons. So, um, as I say, education is, was not on my horizon. And, and in fact, uh, my one experience with uh, standing in front of a class of middle schoolers uh, for about an hour once uh, was not pretty. So I thought I'd better get some help. So in putting this together, uh, I started by uh, assembling a team basically cold calling uh, the national organizations and ended up uh, with a team with lots of names here that you recognize. Uh, I think Ann Fleishley is the only person who is, is not here. She was an intern that year. What we were trying to do is put together an education package for the fall 2011 review cycle. We decided that we would target high school age uh, and uh, we would talk about biochar in the rich science context, not merely as biochar per se, but trying to integrate all those other scientific disciplines. And the result, well, the package was not accepted as a NASA product, and I'll talk about why in the meantime. Nonetheless, the package is available. I think that there's, I think it's entirely usable. You can judge for yourself. So I want to go through what's in the package, and uh, then uh, if you are interested, if you have uh, you know, uh, neighbors who are science teachers or members of the PTA and so on and so forth, uh, there's a, a couple of websites where you can go pick up the package and, and run with it if you have an, uh, an, an urge to. So I talked about the rich science context. Uh, we have several different things in the, pl in the package. First of all, there's a lesson plan. And I'm going to be going through each one of these in detail, so you know, uh, this is just kind of an overview. There's also a lot of things associated with the knowledge. Obviously, we have to start with biochar and the global warming story to involve people uh, specifically. Biochar and sustainability. Uh, Gloria Flora was a member of my team, and she was dealing with arm wrestling with the sustainability and biofuels folks at that point, so she made the point that this was very important to include in this package. Biochar and plants, per se, what it helps, and so on. And I think you can already see that when I do biochar, when I do charts, I like to use color, graphic, animation. I think it makes it much more involving. And all the briefings you'll see uh, involve that kind of uh, treatment. I think it's an opportunity to talk about fire, uh, charring fires, heat and fire, and so on. And also a uh, little elementary chemistry, uh, biochar and pH. But of course, science isn't just knowledge. Science is methodology, too. And you can't really approach science without uh, understanding the methodology that, that is the, the nucleus of its validation. So biochar provides a very good opportunity for students to run their own little experiments, including making a little tea lud, uh, and then running an experiment, and uh, a, a nice controlled experiment. And lastly, science is not merely uh, what you know, but how to find out what other people know. So, you know, an information guide to that. So, the, the, the lesson plan. Uh, we made this lesson plan so that it could be uh, done in a, a series of options. Number one, we could have one great big three-hour session that would go through, you know, the basics. 
with some follow-up uh, to uh, take data on the plant experiment. Or you could do it in two shorter sessions, or if you want to do it in three sessions and so on. Uh, some of the, uh, other, the other stuff, we said the uh, combustion and uh, soil uh, ecosystem stuff, uh, maybe that's optional for more advanced students. Now, uh, NASA's was solicitation said, tell us your academic objectives, a very NASA thing to do. So, all right, here's our academic objectives. Uh, to have the students be able to identify global carbon reservoirs, movements, and the effect or, of increasing or decreasing carbon in those reservoirs, define what are carbon negative processes, distinguish between short-term carbon storage, for example, in biomass and carbon sequestration, uh, build and use a pilot pyrolyzer safely, uh, learn how to use biochar to enhance soil productivity, perform a controlled experiment, and optionally to understand how a, a top burning t lud site type fire is different from a bottom burning fire, uh, to understand the relationship between uh, fungus, bacteria, and pH, uh, to understand something about soil texture and its capacity to hold air, water, and minerals, the relationship between soil's physical properties and its ecosystem. So, you know, it sounds like pretty uh, heady objectives, but I think we were able to incorporate them in a way that is, uh, it is uh, approachable by high school students. Uh, oh yes, and fires effect on soil fertility. Now the uh, presentations all included teacher's notes uh, on the bottom if you, you use the, the biochar, I'm sorry, the uh, PowerPoint notes functions, you'll see that there's a way to put notes right on the, the charts and done that generously. Also on some of the charts, uh, I, had, I included discussion questions uh, that the teachers could use in, in the classroom. So then let me step you through the presentations. First of all is the global warming presentation. I started by making sure that the students understood that we're in this problem because we are unlocking geologic carbon from sequestration. I have to say, that this is a point, when I go out and outreach to the community, I almost always get a question about, you know, why is this different, why is, is charring something different from burning something? Doesn't the carbon dioxide just go off into the atmosphere? They don't get the fact that it's the unlocking of the geologic carbon that gets us into this, this trouble. Uh, make it relevant, uh, we live you know, right there in the mouth of the Chesapeake where it says Hampton. Uh, these are kind of worst case scenarios about sea level rise, but it gets their attention. And then talk about the difference of, uh, between combustion and pyrolysis uh, in a way that is you know, laid out simply and that we need to combine the heat from combustion uh, to provide the heat for pyrolysis. Now this is um, one of my animated graphics that introduces the children to a tea lug. That the, uh, the t lud is a little hard to understand conceptually. The, the retort is much easier, you know, am I airtight chamber, yada, yada. t lud a little bit more difficult, so I, I put together this graphic with lots of animation to show how a t lud works from a scientific point of view. First of all, introduce them to the fact that this is a bottom-fed fire and that we have uh, air holes that are providing the, the, uh, the, the updraft. We add some biomass. And then we ignite a fire on the top. And we make the point that air is depleted of oxygen as it rises through the burning zone. Whoops, I didn't let that one play out. I take my hand off the trigger here. Uh, the air is depleted of oxygen as it rises through the burning zone. And so we put this in motion. The, the blue is the oxygen. So there's no oxygen, so no burning above the flames. And I think that gives a pretty simple graphic representation of what is actually a pretty uh, a difficult concept if you, if you try to think it through in another way. We also want to make the point that, um, that, ch uh, that we're giving off gases at the higher temperatures. And you know they'll be making these tea luds and these tea luds have these things that look like chimneys on top. And we want to show them that no, it's not a chimney it's actually uh, an afterburner, so this is my little graphic that allows them to see this, that the air is flowing in the secondary air holes and burning the combustible gases and so on. So I think you see th in this slide a good example of how I use uh, PowerPoint animation features. By the way, I give master classes in PowerPoint animation um, to, to try to really simplify um, a complex 
concepts for, for students. And then, you know, pop up with a takeaway. The next presentation is uh, on sustainability. Uh, this presentation, uh, after describing the fact that we need biomass for our own food, clothing, shelter, and energy, say yes, but biochar is uh, needed, all, uh, but biomass is also needed for natural processes. And, and I believe it was Gloria that put together the, the content of this presentation. I worked it over, put in more pictures, animation, and so on. But to, to make sure that students walk away with a, a comprehensive understanding of all the natural benefits that are associated with biochar in the large. And then, uh, yes, there is a, a need for us to use biomass in the short term, but there's also a need uh, in the longer term to use biomass uh, in nature and it is our uh, sustainability mandate to, to try to balance these. And then after we talk about the, the, um, the, use, the, the nature of sustainability, we talk about making sure that we're using biomass that nature can well spare, uh, talk about the sources of waste biomass, and plenty of discussion points in the, in the teacher notes uh, for how that can all come about. And then a big takeaway, is this boomba, get off the stage, uh, the biochar ethic, we're making these bios, biochar sustainably, uh, primar uh, primarily from waste streams, minimize the carbon footprint by making it local, and biomass is too valuable to waste. Presentation on biochar and plants, what it helps, when it helps, how it helps. Start off by making a distinction between biochar and compost side-by-side -side comparison so they see that the distinction is that it's not broken down. And again, when I go out to the community, this is something that we have to say specifically or they don't get. Uh, talk about the, the physical structure of biochar. Uh, it's it's a high surface volume and what that means in particular for uh, uh, micro, uh, microbe habitat, root uh, attachment, and water holding. And then a little bit about pH. Uh, I have a whole other presentation on pH, but what we're trying to do is make this, the, the uh, case that in general, uh, biochar raises the pH, so it's good for acidic soils and maybe not so good for alkaline soils. And I also have a, a kind of a summary chart here that uh, talks about, you know, integrates a whole bunch of concepts. What makes soil poor? What are the characteristics of poor soil? What are the characteristics of good soil? and how biochar right down the line uh, can, can convert poor soil into good soil. Now let me show you another, present, uh, another uh, kind of summary um, uh, chart with the animation features. I, I took out all the stops in this, I'm just gonna let it play. And so the, the integrating theme you know, here is how do you then take your biochar once it comes out of the pyrolyzer and make it ready for use. So you break it up, Pea size is smaller so that it has the right air spaces. You saturate it, let it soak in, do it again. Make sure it has all the water it can hold. Mix it with the live compost at about 50-50 bottom. Uh, so, so we can get the microbes in, let it mellow. So this is, you know, kind of uh, an integrate. I think everyone in this room appreciates that this is an approximation. Look, we approximate for students, right? We, we don't want to give them all the detail and scare them away. But this, I think, is a, a good way to, to bring together the concepts of uh, soil spaces and, and water and uh, the microbes and things like that. Oops. Okay, the next, the next presentation, and actually this is what I started with, I'm a physicist, so I like physical stuff, um, is, uh, has to do with fire, uh, and in particular how a charring fire is different from a burning fire. Introduce uh, the children to elementary thermodynamics, how does heat move, convection, conduction, convection, conduction, ra uh, radiation. Uh, big words, but it actually is pretty simple concepts. 
introduce children to the elementary forms of physics, that the color of a flame is proportional to the heat, that a flame tends to arrange itself with uh, the hottest area down and the uh, uh, coolest area up, and that there are, in fact, invisible colors that, that follow this uh, same paradigm. And then uh, I use in this presentation a series of questions and answers, um, you know, about the, 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 again, this is a retort rather than a TLUD. It was, it was built for another purpose, but um, to show, you know, why you need insulation, why you need a lid, why you need a chimney, and, and so on. So, um, you know, again, tying back the elementary thermodynamics that we already uh, brushed with the uh, application in a specific in a specific context. So here's uh, one of my big integrating charts. Again, this is a retort, not a TLUD, but uh, it shows you how I'm bringing together a lot of the different concepts of, uh, is involved with the, the pyrolysis of biochar. So we start off by uh, raising the temperature a little bit, and we're killing anything in there that's alive, and we're boiling off free water, and the smoke looks clear. And then as we uh, go up in temperature, we're starting to bake out water from the, the, mud, uh, the, the wood, and the smoke is still clear, maybe a little light. And as we move into the real pyrolysis phase, we're breaking down the wood and um, uh, turning it into char, and the smoke is, is a little um, darker, and the combustible gases are going to leak out of the chamber and flare up and so on and so forth. So again, you see a, a big, uh, an, a way of integrating a lot of the concepts that they've learned uh, in the context of biochar. pH, uh, this is something that one of the master gardeners that I've been working with in the Hampton Roads area put together, again, the basics for me, and I added my own you know, flavor to the animation and the picture. Uh, pH, of course, uh, is uh, very important in, in uh, setting what chars belong in what soils. So uh, they need to understand that. So first of all, we talk about the logarithmic uh, nature, the pH scale, and what is pH exactly. Ta uh, introduce the concept of uh, neutralization, that there are acids and bases and they neutralize each other. Um, and the concept that uh, different areas of the country have different pHs so that you're going to have to, you know, to get a good balance, you're going to have to make sure that you uh, consider your local soils when you decide what biochar to use, or even whether to use biochar. And that different plants have different needs for, for uh, different pHs. Then, again, starting to be a little bit more sophisticated, build up the idea that uh, fungi, bacteria, plants, and animals have different pH ranges where they're comfortable, uh, and uh, that the whole thing together is a system and that getting the pH out of balance can, can crash the whole system. Talk about pH and mineral availability, how a nice neutral pH makes the most, most minerals available to the most plants and the effect of, of mineral deficiencies because of pH. And then kind of, a, again, an integrating uh, concept that says that biochar is usually alkaline depending upon what temperature it's made at. And as a result, it's good for neutralizing uh, soils. But don't forget, the soils are also kind of neutralizing the biochar. So you may have to add a little bit more as time goes on. And also noting that the ash uh, could be used, but it's very often. So now we're moving into the experimental uh, part of the presentation. Um, and uh, the, the uh, stove that we're using is, a, is one of Jock Gill's TLUDs. I don't think Jock is here. If he is, I'd like to meet him. I, I've never had, in fact, this conference is the first time I've met most of my teammates on this thing. Um, and, and Jock did, uh, you know, uh, his, his usual enthusiastic um, approach to, to making a TLUD stove. Put together a pretty simple uh, construction plan, uh, materials list, a tool kit, a uh, number step-by-step -step instructions. I envision this in a classroom where the teacher is, is uh, you know, trying to keep a bunch of children uh, occupied and they say, teacher, what's number, step number four, what am I doing here? So having the numbers was important. Lots of illustrations, every step is, is uh, thoroughly illustrated. Also written in a style with second person voice, so it's, you know, not the heady, you know, the, the uh, top must be 
bent back to this angle or something that's U should bend and so forth. We also have the teacher's guide to making biochar, uh, beginning with a, I thought, rather exhaustive list of safety in instructions written for the teacher uh, so the teacher knows uh, what tools and so forth, and, and pretty exhaustive. Now, Jock's approach, I believe Kelpie put this together. I can't remember exactly, but I think that she, she was the one who, who originally put this together. Uh, and uh, the approach is to use uh, wood pellets because they happen to be easily available, relatively cheap, uh, and so on. So, you know, it was a 16-page guide or something like that, a pretty extensive, with, uh, say for future reference, about a page and a half of safety instructions. And then the teacher's guide to plant experiments. I mean, the most important thing I think that the children can take away is hypothesis testing. Um, generate what they think is a, is a good hypothesis, um, set up the experiments to, uh, to do that, and, um, and then finally take data that can confirm or deny the hypothesis. So we have a, a guide, again, uh, nicely step-by-step -step with the illustration uh, with um, the uh, uh, very specific instructions about what you want to do. Okay, so that was the package. What's not to love? Well, here's the answer to that. Uh, the panel concluded uh, that for the reasons listed below, this product needs to be largely redesigned before it can, can be submitted to the panel for review again. Okay, well, there's little link to NASA science education. All right, um, this doesn't involve air or space, and NASA's not doing any research in biochar, so all right, uh, fair enough. I didn't have a good hook to NASA science in that. Global warming apparently isn't enough of a hook. Safety concerns with the high temperature processes were not addressed. Hmm, page and a half of safety instructions wasn't good enough for them, okay. Uh, the product is not well fitted to the existing high school curriculum. Uh, requirements. Hmm. We did have it reviewed by a teacher. In fact, um, our volunteer, Ann Fleishley, I believe, was a science teacher, and she did review it, and another high school science teacher did, and they both said, looked good to me, uh, but the committee apparently uh, was a little bit more uh, fastidious than they were. Uh, the instructions and procedures were not complete. Hmm. Uh, 16 pages of instructions incomplete. Okay. And uh, the details, re detailed revisions needed to be addressed. And they gave me a list of 28 items that needed to be taken into account. Well, okay. Um, I get to do this on very small fractions of my time. Uh, and uh, so I kind of threw up my hands and said, I guess uh, this, is, this is not working for me. Uh, I can't, you know, don't have the background to do this in a way that would satisfy the panel and thus ended my never very promising career in education. So, uh, but the, the packages are still out there. Uh, Barry Hollister and Jock Gill uh, both volunteered uh, their websites as a place where I could store them. They're, they're still there very much as I flip through them for you. Uh, by all means, pick them up if you want to, you know, use them for schools. Uh, this presentation, I believe, will be on the conference website. Uh, the links will be here. Or talk to Barry, or talk to Jock. Uh, it's on their sites and still there. I checked them uh, just before we came to this conference. So if anything in there would help you with your outreach or your uh, school education product, by all means, uh, pick those up, use them. Um, I'd be very gratified to know that they weren't sitting around in some dusty back backwater of the web. Okay, um, sure. And I think if you go to either one of, either Berkshire Harmony or Greater Democracy, uh, you'll, you'll be able to find your way to, to the links through, through Hotlink. Ready to go? Okay, well, this is my, my concluding chart. Uh, you can't work for NASA without being reminded constantly that we live on a very limited planet under a fragile 
tissue of air in a universe that is exceedingly hostile. Earth is the only home we, will, we have, the only home we will probably ever have, and it is worth every effort we can get to make this planet uh, work for us for the indefinite future. Our children will be the first generation in human history that will have to manage the planet as a planet. It will no longer be good enough just to use regional, to just to take care of our, our local, regional, pet, uh, parochial interests and let the rest go. In order to meet this challenge, they will have to use all the knowledge that they can have. Yes, knowledge from history and philosophy and psychology and the wisdom of art and literature. But I think that the the knowledge that will be of most use to them is the knowledge from the natural sciences, not a factoid-based, you know, religious thing where I pick some things to, to uh, believe and other things not to believe, but an integrated, holistic view of science. You know, we're leaving our, the next generation some serious problems, but we're also leaving them an enormous patrimony of knowledge. And I think when history looks back on our generation, they will say that the patrimony of scientific knowledge is our greatest enduring contribution to humanity, the knowledge that our generations have created. And so now it's up to us to hand that knowledge off as effectively as we can to the next generation so they can manage the planet as a planet. Thank you.